Let me uh, read that verse to us again. Galatians 6, verse 9. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. The Apostle Paul is closing out his letter to the Christians in Galatia. He was urging them to continue to press on. Fight the good fight. Don't give up. He's, his message, his main message has been to those who would revert to a works theology. Going back to religion and, and, and all the rules. And Paul is saying, no, no. That's not what our faith is all about. It's not about going to church and giving to various things and praying and fasting as a means to get right with God. No. We are to give our lives wholly and only to Jesus Christ. And only then can we have the righteousness of God. Only then can our sins be forgiven. He says in, in Galatians 1 verses 15 and 16, we know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So he makes a strong point that our good works, our good works are not to get us into heaven, but that our good works are a result of our gratitude to our Lord. It's, it's like a friend of ours who's missionaries. They are missionaries in, in Africa and they've just come home. And, and another do, this man is a doctor and his wife is a, uh, a nurse practitioner. They've been in the field for many years and they've, they've come home. And a, a doctor friend of theirs has given them a house. Given them a house. And, and this family is so, so deeply grateful for what this person has done. And I can imagine if the man who owned the house and gave it to him came and knocked on the door and said, hi, I, I just stopped by. I was, was wondering if you'd, you'd give me something to eat. If the, no, no, I'm sorry, thanks. Please go away. No. <laughs> they, would, they would say, oh, we, we are so delighted that you've come. We want to give back to you. We want to show you our love. That's, that's the picture here that Paul is talking about when he talks about good works. So at the end of this letter, Galatians 6 verse 9, this verse that we've read, that we've just read, Paul, Paul is saying, do not become weary. Do not become weary in doing good. For at the right time, you'll reap a harvest if you don't give up. I want to take that verse apart for us this morning very quickly. I, I see in that verse, first of all, a command. Don't become weary. He's saying, don't become weary. And, you know, the thing is, we do. <laughs> how, how many of us have family members that we have prayed for and prayed for and prayed for? Year after year after year. And at times we say, what's the use? The Lord is saying, no, don't become weary. Stay with it. Continue on. How, how many times have, have we tried to share the gospel with somebody and we walk away and think, oh, well, boy, I really blew that. Uh, man, I just get weary. Or, or, we, or we've tried to help somebody and it's just, they've, they've just not heard anything that we've tried to do. They've not received anything we've tried to give. And we, we, we tend to become weary. And God is saying to us this morning, don't become weary. Don't become weary. I, I, I can remember praying for years for a particular individual and, and, and God kept saying, don't. Don't become weary. Just continue on. I, I will take care of you. He's saying, don't. We've got to refuse Satan's attempts to discourage us. We've got to refuse to be put off. We've got to refuse to give up. But then he comes to a second part, the promise. He says, for in good time, 
you will reap a harvest. Here's the command. Don't become weary. And, and here's the promise. Because in good time, you will reap a harvest. What an incredible promise for us. God is telling us that we, we can reap a promise from him. That he will allow us to succeed. The problem is, this in good time. We want God's promise now. God's telling us, no, in good time, in my time. God is saying, men and women, to you and me this morning, trust me. Continue on. Press on. Don't give up. Because in my time, I will cause you to reap a harvest. I love, I love what Spurgeon said has said, and it's become kind of a, a foundational slogan for me and our family in our walk. Spurgeon said, I may not be able to trace God's hand, but I can always trust his heart. That's where we live, folks. That's, that's the command and that's the promise. But then there's a condition. If we do not give up, don't give up. God is saying to you and me this morning, don't give up. Don't be a quitter. How many times have we reached out to family members, those we love or those we know about who've given up on God? They've, they've just, they've given up on God. Or young people have gone off to college and this one professor they meet that discourages them and talks down about God and they walk out of college no longer trusting in God. Or some terrific accident, this horrific accident has happened and they say, well, if that's the way you are, God, then I don't want any more, I don't want any more part of you. No. God is saying, trust me. Trust me. Don't give up. I am God. I am sovereign. I will not answer you necessarily on the time frame that you want. But I will answer you. Well, that's the passage of scripture that I wanted to bring to us as a basis for our time together this morning. That's the lesson of Galatians 6, 9. And it's a lesson it's a lesson that Margie and I learned here uh, a couple months ago. We want to share you, the rest of this message is really an illustration of Galatians 6-9. But I want, to, I want to caution us before we get into the story. It's not about Margie and me. Please, please understand that. It is all about a sovereign, faithful God who wants to work in our lives and who every now and then by his grace pulls back the curtain and allows us to see, yes, my son, yes, my daughter, I have done exceeding abundantly above all that you could have ever asked for or even imagined. And that is true in this story for my dear wife and me. And so I... I want to tell you that it's all about being encouraged. So I pray, the bottom line, I pray you will walk out of these doors today and you will be encouraged to be continuing to press on and not give up, knowing that God in his timing will cause you to reap a harvest for his honor and glory. So here's the story. <laughs> 43 years ago, I was a junior at seminary. Seminary's three years, freshman, junior, senior. I was a junior. I was a middle student. Margie and I had just been married for nine months. We were at Asbury Theological Seminary. It's a Methodist seminary, but it's a very evangelical seminary. And there's a college right across the street. That junior year, we joined a team of people who were involved in a Christian music festival, a three-day Christian music festival, Friday night, Saturday all day, and then Sunday till noon, a three-day Christian music, music festival called Ichthus. Ichthus is a Greek term. It stands for Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. Jesus Christos Theos, we are soterios. Say that back to me. No, that's all right. That's okay. Amen. 
It, it, it was a, a festival that was created by my Greek professor, Bob Lyon, 16 years prior. 16, 16 years prior, I think it was, in 1961. Yeah. As, a, as an answer to Woodstock. Dr. Lyons wanted to create a Christian festival that would draw Christians together and they could hear Christian music and they could hear Christian speakers. And it grew and grew and grew until on average we would have 12,000 young people coming together in tents and campers. Well, that year in 1977, we, we had a marvelous time together. Margie and I were part of a team. We were learning. At the end of that year, the uh, folks that were our seniors said, that's it. We're not doing ICTHUS anymore. It's too hard. It takes too much time. It's a year-long program, and we just don't have time with all of our studies and everything else. We're not going to do it. And so people came to us because they knew we really wanted it to continue. People came to us, and they said, would you head this up? If you'll head this up, there's a group of us that will join you and, and we'll come alongside you and, and we'll be with you. Well, we were praying about this and we had older, more mature Christians come alongside us and caution Margie and me and said, you don't really want to do this. You need to be very serious about this because this is arduous. This is going to take a lot out of your lives and you are young married. This could damage your marriage. and You need to be very, very serious about not doing this. But as we prayed, we felt God was calling us to do it. And we had this group of dear friends from the seminary and from the college as well who, who were willing to join in. And, and we held it off. We pulled it off. Ixthus 1978. 12,000 young people attended this, this Friday night, all day Saturday, and, and then Sunday at noon it broke up. Well, Saturday night, as this festival was going forward, it started to rain. It didn't rain hard, but it was raining. And of course, we were, we were kind of undone. We were thinking, oh no, Lord, please. We don't want this rain to deter people from going forward and, and giving their lives to, to Christ. Please, Lord, don't allow that to happen. And we, we pled the blood of Christ and we prayed and prayed. And I know others, others were praying. We walked around the campground praying that that night. And of course, the festival went on, and then Sunday, as, as we said, it, it, it closed out, and, and we know that there were decisions that were, that were made for, for Christ that, that evening. It, it, was, it was very, very special. Skip forward now, 42 years. <laughs> two months ago, two months ago, Margie's sister, twin sister, and her brother-in-law, my brother-in-law, both of whom are, are believers. They were looking at Mike Pence's testimony. And as they were reading his testimony, they called us up and they said, we were just reading and Mike Pence in his testimony says, he came to faith at a, a, a festival in Wilmore, Kentucky called Ichthus. And we were wondering, what year did you guys head that up? And we said, well, we headed it up in 1978. They said, that's the year. He came to Christ. Whew. What, a, what a revelation. How, how thrilled we were. Lord, you, you, even when we didn't know, you were working to, to bring the future vice president of the United States to yourself, and you had us involved in that. Well, I, I shared that with, with the elders when we got together and we, you know, it was just one of those remarkable moments that we were sharing. And Pastor Gary says, you know, you ought to write a letter to the vice president. <laughs> well, you know, you kind of think about that. And, of course, on the other side, you're thinking, well, he's never going to get a letter from, I mean, I can write it, but he's never going to get it. Well, I did. I did. And I didn't even tell the elders because I figured it wasn't ever going to even get to them. On June 9, I wrote a letter, and you see it up here on the board and, and it, write, it says this, I'm writing with a deep sense of joy for a profound lesson the Lord has taught me, and it includes you. If you'll permit me a short context, I was a student at Asbury Theological Seminary from 75 to 78. My wife and I were married in June 76. In the aftermath of ICTHU 77, many of my fellow seminarians felt we should close ICTHUS permanently. 
My wife and I were told that if we took it on, the year-long work and planning could wreck our young marriage. But the Lord moved us to head up through 78, and a small but committed group of men and women joined us. We arranged for a program that included Bob Laurent and Mike Warnke as our speakers, and musicians that included Andres Blackwood and Company, New Hope, Jeremiah People, Pat Terry Group, Good News Circle, Honey Tree, and Sela. Here's my point. Saturday late afternoon and early evening, as my wife and I were patrolling the Wilmore campground, we were disheartened because of the rain. We were convinced that people would be put off by the weather. But he had other plans. He moved on the future vice president of the United States to receive him as his savior and Lord. And I cannot write that without tears, and I couldn't. So many times over the years, we feel as Christians that our efforts to win the lost are to no avail. But periodically, the Lord in his mercy pulls back the curtain and shows us that even our meager efforts are multiplied by his grace. Mr. Vice President, we're so very thankful for your heart for the Lord Jesus and for your courageous leadership. Please know we pray for your family and your team daily. God bless you and keep your armor. I told him to keep his armor on. I wrote that letter on June 9. And again, I just thought, well, you know, he'll, he'll probably never even get that. <laughs> and to bolster my assumption, we learned later that the vice president receives approximately 2,000 letters a day. He has a team of people that do nothing but cull through his letters and pull out about eight so that he can digest that in a, in a reasonable manner. So we figured there's no way he's going to get that letter. Well, two weeks ago, on July 6th, I received a text from another person who had been involved in Ichthus, and, and he said, you and your wife need to go on YouTube, and you need to listen to the vice president's speech in Dallas at First Baptist at a Celebrate Freedom Sunday rally. You need to listen to that. And he told us, you, could, you can listen to the whole thing, which we did, or you can scroll forward to minute 24. And I've asked Kim if she would pull that speech up. I want you to listen to the last three minutes, remembering the letter that he received on June 9. And I leave here today that God is at work. And I had occasion to be reminded that even when it doesn't seem that way, God is still working a little bit earlier this week. You see, I received a letter from a pastor who leads a church not far from Jacksonville, Florida. He, he told me of a time that he and his new bride were attending uh, Asbury Seminary in Wilmore, Kentucky in 1977. It was a place where they held in the spring every year a Christian music festival. They present the gospel with preachers. They present what was then the early versions of contemporary Christian music. Have young people attend from all over the Midwest. But he wrote to me that in 1977, they had decided at the seminary to just continue the event. But he and his new bride felt called to do the work. He wrote to me and said that several friends told us that it would be very hard on our new marriage and that we shouldn't do it. But he said we answered the call. We gathered a few other seminarians to help us and they worked a whole year to arrange the event in the spring of 1978. And then he said, then the night came, the culminating evening on Saturday night where he and his new bride were walking through the camp area. And it was raining. And they were disappointed. They thought it all had been for naught. And then he said, and that's because I didn't know that that night, a future vice president of the United States of America would be giving his life to Jesus Christ.
He wrote to me, I cannot write this without tears. And I could not read it without tears. Because I remember that night, sitting on a hillside, it was raining, and it was like I, I heard the words for the first time, but God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whoever might believe in him might not perish but have eternal life. And I stood up and I walked down that night not out of a sense of intellectual assent, but because my heart was broken with gratitude for what had been done for me on the cross. I'm working on a letter to that pastor, <laughs> which I will not be able to write without tears. And I'm simply gonna say to him and his wife, now I know who else to thank for that night so many years ago. The lesson in his letter was even when things don't seem like they're going the way we expected, they're going the way he expected. We can claim those other ancient words that have been over the fireplace in our home in Indiana, in the governor's residence, in the vice president's residence today. They read, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. And I believe with all my heart on this Celebrate Freedom Sunday and every day, that if we will but hold fast to him, we'll see our way through these challenging times. We will restore our nation's health. We will renew our freedom and we will inspire people across this land with our witness of the love and compassion and strength that comes in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Thank you for letting me join you today. God bless you. And God bless America. I, I, want, I just want to be very clear. This is not a political time this morning. We're simply honoring what God is doing in the heart of a fellow believer. And I want you to hear that. You may have a different perspective. But this man, this man has a strong strong commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's just very, very special. Well, if it ended there, can you imagine? That would have been it. We, we would have been just absolutely thrilled. But the story doesn't stop there. <laughs> A week ago, on July 10th, Friday, July, this past Friday, July 10th, 1.34 in the afternoon, but who's counting, right? <laughs> he got a phone call, and it said Washington, D.C. across my phone. Well, you know, like you, I get calls from Washington, D.C. Wanting, wanting contributions, so I, I clicked it off immediately. The phone buzzed on my wife's phone, Washington, D.C. Margie took it and turned it off. <laughs> Immediately, she got a text, a voicemail, and it was from a man who said, uh, I need to talk with you. So we clicked, we called back the number, and Marge had her phone on, on um, speaker, and I was sitting next to her, and, and she calls this, this person, and, and the man uh, said, are you Margaret DeWitt? Margie said, yes. He said, are you married to Chip DeWitt? <laughs> yeah. And she said, yes, and he's right here. I have him on speaker. And I said, who is this? <laughs> and he said, my name is Aaron Chang. I'm the director of advance for the vice president of the United States. 
And I'm calling to ask you, the vice president and his wife were wondering if you would be kind enough to visit with them tomorrow afternoon when they fly down to Jacksonville, Florida. We said, well, let me check our schedule. And I mean, it was, it was hard to talk. I mean, can you imagine getting a phone call like that? We said, of course, of course, we would be so honored. He said, well, you'll receive a form in the mail, security form, if you'll fill that out. And, and then if that is okay, then we'll send you the details of the visit that we'd like you to have. And so we did. We filled out the security form and we got details back from, from them. And they told us that we, would, we were to show up at the Epping Forest Country Club and Yacht Club, which is only about 15 minutes away from our home in Mandarin. Mandarin. We were to show up there at 3 o'clock and we would be ushered through the gate by one of the other aides. Her name is Lauren. And, and then we would be COVID tested and then we would be able to meet with the uh, vice president and his wife. So we drive up to the gate and uh, the fellas in the gate, you know, have this list and they read down the list and we're waiting there, you know, this is great, you know. And the guy says, uh, excuse me, sir, I'm sorry, your name isn't on the list. Uh -oh. <laughs> oh my. So yeah, he checked twice, he checked twice. He said, I'm sorry, sir, your name isn't on the list. Would you kind of pull over to the side? We'll see what we have to do here. So I pull over to the side and I pull out my phone and I call Lauren and it's busy. I call her a second time, it's busy. I figure, man, of course she's busy. She's got so many irons in the fire. Third time, I'm starting to call her and I see this young lady running up to the car. It's Lauren. <laughs> and here, we had gotten there early and so she didn't have our name on the list yet. And so she walked us through the gate and takes us to the place where we're to be tested for COVID. We go in there, we get swabbed, and we wait for 25 minutes, had a nice conversation with a, a couple of other young people <laughs> telling them this whole story. And uh, 25 minutes later, they say, you're fine, you're, you're negative. Uh, so uh, they took us into the main building. We go into the main country club, and, and there's black curtains on every window so that there's no snipers or anything. And we're in this room, it's lit, but it's dark. And they put us in a four foot by four foot taped off social distancing square. It's a room that probably houses maybe 60 people. And we're standing there and we watch secret service people come in and out. There's a couple technicians with cameras and microphones and stuff and music. The 60s and 70s, oh, I love it. <laughs> Music was, was playing. And, and we stood there and, and you know, just talked and, and whatnot for 70 minutes till about 10 minutes to five. And about a quarter to five, people started coming in. And you need to understand why the vice president had come to, to the Epping Forest Country Club Yacht Club. He had come to meet with the Republican, the F Florida Republican Committee to thank them because they were the ones that are being asked to put together the Republican National Convention, which normally takes about two years. They were being asked to do it in about three months. And so he had come to thank them. And so all these people were coming in and they were standing in their little squares. And about 10 minutes, he was, he was, he was to speak at five o'clock. About 10 minutes to five, the Secret Service come and work toward the front the Secret Service come and take us away. People are, you know, like, wait, wait. And we get ushered back through a hallway and into a back room. And as we open, they open the door, there's the vice president and his wife sitting. They stand up immediately and give us an elbow bump. <laughs> Wish we could have gotten a hug. And they said that later too, but couldn't. The vice president very graciously said, hey, let's get a photograph. And so we, we stood there while the, you know, the, Photographers took some pictures and then we sat down, f picture the scene, we're in this room, there's four chairs, full, four folding chairs. He's sitting and his wife and they're facing us and we're facing them about three feet apart. We're that close. It was an intimate, intimate 15 minute time with the vice president and his wife. I mean, they were so real, so, so genuine. 
And immediately the vice president said, so tell us, tell us your journey after Ichthus. And we, we very quickly told them where we'd been, what we had done. And then we asked, we asked, well, Mr. Vice President, could you, could you elaborate on, on what happened that night and what, what transpired? And, and he shared. He said, you know, Chip, Margie, there isn't a day goes by that I don't think of that night on that rainy night in Wilmore in my life and how God changed my life. Mrs. Pence, a number of times, in a number of ways, thanked us. She said, thank you for answering the call. Thank you for answering the call and what it meant for my husband and for us. We, we talked about our kids. That's a kind of a natural thing. Uh, we had a picture of our, our three boys and, and, and uh, our two nephews, uh, our, our three sons and our nephew. At one point, uh, the picture was taken when our youngest son, who's here at the Naval Air Station, was first commissioned. And it was at that moment when all three of our sons were on active duty. Pretty quickly after that, our oldest son, who was a, a, a captain in the Marines, uh, in communications, he'd been in Afghanistan. He was re he was going into uh, uh, the what's that called reserves, you know. And but this was a moment when when all four of them, those four boys, were on active duty, and we had taken that picture. And and also the the our youngest our youngest nephew, who was not in the military, was there. He he's in IT, and we showed that picture, and 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 we had seen and heard from them the. The parallels between their kids and our kids. They they have a son who is a navy, a son-in-law who's a navy pilot. They have a son who is a marine pilot, just like our son was. And they have a daughter who is just graduated from Yale Law School. And they have a another daughter who is is going to uh, Harvard Divinity School. And and so we were able to kind of talk back and forth about our kids. It was just a, a very special time. And then at a, at, a, at a certain point pulled out this, this uh, copy of the Ichthus brochure for that year. We didn't have one. And I, I, I asked the, the vice president to forgive us. I said, we, we don't have an actual brochure from, from the year, but I have a copy here. And as soon as I can get one from Asbury Theological Seminary, when they open up from COVID, I, I will try to get one and get it to you. But here, it's just a copy. And it, on the front page, it had the, the, uh, the uh, Ichthus logo that year. And the theme was Psalm 1. And it had that logo. Gave that to the vice president. He took that. You saw his eyes wide. And a smile came on his face. He turns to his wife and he says, Hun, look, this is the same logo that I had on my t-shirt for many years. My Ichthus t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and then he turns to us and he says, Would you and Margie autograph that for us? <laughs> we autographed something for the vice president. I mean, it was like, sure. <laughs> you know? Sure, we'll do that. And so our oldest son, when he knew we were going to do this, had told us, well, Dad, Mom, why don't you take a picture of the family? And maybe, maybe if it isn't too tacky, maybe you can give him a picture and maybe he'll, he'll sign it for you. Well, the picture of the family that we had was taken this past Christmas when everybody came down to our new home here. And we were all in our Toy Story pajamas. <laughs> So we hand him this picture, and he and his dear wife signed it to the Dear to Wit family with gratitude and love in Christ, Mike and Karen Pence. So we, we had a, a time to uh, close out, to, to pray. Uh, and Mr. Pence uh, said to his wife, uh, Hun, why don't, why don't you pray for us? Because we, we were overtime. We were five minutes past five, and, and he was to have spoken be speaking at five. People were out there, you know, waiting for this. And, and uh, I, I interrupted at that point. And I said, Mr. Vice President, could, could I also please pray for you? I said, our church, our church has been praying for you and we will continue to pray for you. Could I pray? And, and he said, of course. And Mrs. Pence said, why don't I pray? And then you could close us in prayer. And, and so we had an opportunity to thank the Lord for them and pray for them and, and, and bring you folks into that time of, of prayer for, for our vice president. Our, our objective was twofold. We, we wanted to thank this president for his leadership over this COVID pandemic. 
and all that's involved in that incredibly and the work that he's done and the team that he's brought together. And then secondly, we wanted to thank him for his stance for the Lord Jesus Christ, unquestioned stance for Christ. Well, when we were done praying, the, the vice president kinds of, kind of nods to one of his aides and the aide hands him this eight and a half by 11 envelope. And of course it was his letter back to us. And so I, I've asked Kim if she would uh, throw that up on the screen. And dear Pastor DeWitt and Margaret, thank you for your heartfelt letter. You said you could not write it without tears and I could not read it without tears. I was moved to learn more of the back story of ICTHU 78, how you both were at its center months, at its center months in advance, contemplating whether even to proceed with planning the Christian fest music festival amid voices cautioning that such an undertaking would harm your young marriage. 42 years later, let me say in behalf of all of us who benefited by your ministry so long ago, thank you for answering the call. The Lord used your labors that year in my small life and I'm certain in the lives of many others then and since. I had the privilege of sharing a few words about that night at First Baptist Church, Dallas, a few weeks ago and I couldn't help but share about your letter. I reflected upon the lesson you aptly shared with me that sometimes things don't go the way we hope and expect, but it turns out that they're going just the way he expects. At this year's prayer, National Prayer Breakfast, I had the special privilege of sharing a little about my faith journey through a pocket-sized leaf of the organizers included in every attendee's welcome packet. That spring night long ago in Wilmore, Kentucky features prominently Given your seminal role in the events described, I thought you might enjoy a copy. Thank God every day for that rainy night in Wilmore. Now I know who else to thank. So thank you, Chip and Margaret, for being open to the Lord's leading so long ago. May God richly bless you and your family, even as you're, you were a blessing to me and my family so many years ago. Sincerely, Michael Pence. Hallelujah. Amen. Again, it's, it's not about us, men and women. It is not about us. It is all about what God does if we're faithful, if we'll trust him. And I pray, <clears throat> I pray that you will take and use this very story in the lives of others. We've already been hearing from a number of people who've taken this story uh, and, and, and shared it with friends and relatives. Uh, and and we, that's our purpose. We, we want all of us as believers to be motivated and encouraged to keep on keeping on. Paul says, do not be weary in doing good, for at the proper time, you will reap a harvest if you don't give up. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you, thank you, thank you for your goodness, your grace, for the ways in which you work in our lives. Most of the time, we don't see it. We just continue on trusting you, but Lord, every now and then, you, you give us one of these special moments that really say, I, I'm there with you. I'm, I'm working in your life in many ways that you, you don't even realize, that you'll only know when, when you get home. And so keep, keep on. And we love you, Lord, for that lesson. I pray that you would encourage us all. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you receive the benediction? It comes from a familiar passage. Jude writes to us, To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now, and forevermore. Amen. 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 God bless you. You're dismissed.